Good morning, everybody. My name is Joe Bandle. Welcome to Deadly Days, Tales of Dark Fantasy. This is uh, episode number seven. And today we're going to lighten things up a little bit, but first we'll just get through some uh, basic introductions. Uh, every week, once a week, I put out a new podcast that is a story. And it's a story that I've translated from the German from a, around 100 years ago, from the 1890s to the 1920s is generally what I do. I translate these stories and I publish them. Uh, so if you're interested in these stories, reading them in a book, getting them in book form, uh, you can go to my website. On, it's at uh, www.lulu, which is L-U-L-U dot com slash spotlight slash anarchist banjo which is kind of the online name I go by or you can simply uh, google Joe Bandel band like a rock and roll band E-L or you can go to lulu.com and you can just uh, look up my name that way uh, I speak what we're doing is I have uh, the fa my favorite author has always been Hans, Heinz, Avers, or yours. So we're going to be doing a lot of stories by him, but also another favorite of mine is Karl Hans Strobel. The two of them are really considered some of the greatest horror or dark fantasy writers in, in the, that period of German history. I also translate uh, a magazine, Der Orchidean Garten, that first came out in 1919. It was considered the world's first fantasy magazine. I translate those stories and I'm publishing those stories, those magazines with the original art. And we're going to draw from stories from there as well. Plus I did, I translated some stories from Cocaine Magazine for Side Real Press in England. And I'm going to draw from those stories as well. So what we do is kind of do a rotation. Uh, Ewers, Strobel, the Orchidean Garden, Cocaine, or the other way around, however it goes. But anyway, today we're back to Ewers, Hans Heinz Ewers, or Avers. Uh, so, the first, like I said, it's going to be kind of, um, before I forget, give this uh, a like if you like this, please give it a like, uh, share it with other people. This is how the word gets out. I'm going to be, I've got three years at least worth of stories that I can be putting out here. So there's going to be quite a collection. It's going to be uh, quite a mix. Some are going to be long, some are going to be short. The last two have been fairly short, so we can have a longer one today. And we're going to have a little fun with it. So this one is called My Burial. And it is from my book, Hans Heinz Ewers, Volume 1. Three days before my death, I sent a postcard to the Red Riders. Even so, this story should really have occurred in Berlin. The Berliner is refined. They say lift instead of elevator. They are gents, and on no account, gentlemen. When they want something done, they send a dispatch to the Messenger Boy Institute. 
you can gather from that why this story never happened in Berlin. I wrote to the Red Riders because they sounded very nice and not to the Messenger Boys because they would have thrown my postcard away. My card announced. Three days after receipt of this card, please pick up a crate for the cemetery. The presence of all Red Riders is required. Payment and further instructions will be with the crate. Then my name and address. The Red Riders came promptly, and with them came the Chief Rider. In Berlin, you would say the General Director of the Messenger Boy Institute. He was inspecting a large, coffin-sized crate on which I had painstakingly painted glass, fragile, caution, and do not drop. <clears throat> Naturally, my corpse was in the old crate, but I had not closed the cover because I wanted a beautiful funeral and needed to pay attention to make sure everything went right. First, the chief took the gold and counted it. Forty-five red riders for two hours? It fits. He put the gold in his wallet and looked at my instructions. No, he said then. It doesn't. We don't do this. I made my voice real hollow and answered from out of the crate. The red riders will do anything. The chief rider was not certain where the voice had come from. He scratched his nose. Should I? He said. Should I? His conscience hit him. On all his advertisements, it explicitly stated, the Red Riders will do anything. One of the boys wanted to nail the cover down, but the chief waved him back. Forward, he cried, and pointed to the directions. It specifically says here the cover must stay open. I will do what I'm paid to do. There will be no black marks on my account, even if it would be allowed. First, we say a short prayer. Do any of you know a short prayer? None of the Red Riders knew a short prayer. What about a longer one? But they couldn't get a longer one right. The Red Riders will do anything, I said hollowly from out of my crate. The Chief Rider looked around. But of course, he replied, replied quickly, there is still a beautiful one if the Red Riders can't come, with it, come up with anything else. He turned to all the youngsters. Fritz, you certainly know a prayer. I know a prayer, all right, opinion the urchin, but not ordinarily for. That doesn't matter, the Chief Rider interrupted, whether it is an ordinary prayer or an unordinary one. The important thing is that we pray. So say your prayer and everyone else say it with him. Fritz prayed and the others shouted along as loud as they could. Come Lord Jesus, be our guest and let these gifts to us be blessed. Amen, said the chief writer unctuously. That is really an excellent prayer. Remember it for the future. He followed my orders completely. Then they loaded the crate on a cargo tricycle that the strongest, strongest youth drove. Fritz needed to sit on top so the cover wouldn't fall off. All the Red Riders sprang onto their bicycles and went as fast as they could through the streets. The people cheered at the lively train of Red Riders. In my crate, I thought how different it was to be so enjoyably rushing to the churchyard instead of going slowly in a black funeral carriage with ghastly mourners trotting alongside. In 20 minutes we were there. They leaned their bicycles against the fence 
and the four largest carefully unloaded the crate. The chief writer looked at my instructions and directed. Second crossroads hit the corridor left from the main road. On the right side, grave number 48678. That is where the solemn procession brought the old crate. The grave was already open. A pair of large shovels were stuck in a pile of loose dirt. A single red rider crept into the grave and carefully placed the crate. Then they stood in a wide circle around the grave. Everyone light a cigarette, the chief rider commanded. Most of them had their own cigarettes and offered their tins to those that didn't. I can't smoke, said Fritz. It makes me... But I interrupted him. The red riders will do anything. The chief glanced around his company, deeply insulted. Who said that, he cried. I will not tolerate any more useless words from any of you. Obviously, the Red Riders will do anything. You, Fritz, smoke. A Red Rider must smoke as well as they can pray. Fritz lit his cigarette, and so did the others. Now, said the chief rider, looking again at his slip of paper, now we begin the funeral service. We sing a melody like we are in a dark, gloomy forest. Forest. All together, this verse. The Red Riders will do anything for the living and the dead. It is our job. They all sang so that it resounded, and I sang along with them in the crate. Now comes the eulogy, he continued. Today we have the honor and great pleasure of being permitted for the first time to escort someone to their finally resting, final resting place. We don't know any more of his virtues except for the fact that his last request was to permanently set a memorial in the hearts of all Red Riders by paying them each three marks and 45 pennies for two hours work. Friendly patronizing aside, on these grounds, let us all join in a cheer for the blessed deceased. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. And the Red Riders screamed, hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. Very good, said the Chief Rider. If I were in that crate, I would gratefully applaud. Now, to close, we will sing the favorite song of the deceased and let him sleep in the Lord. Daughter of Zion, be glad. Jerusalem, rejoice. It sounded out across the cemetery to where another group was singing at the third crossroads, eight corridors down and left from the main road. That is to say, to where another funeral was taking place at grave number 48679, on the left side diagonally across from me. They were burying some honorable privy counselor, and there was a horrendous number of people, professors, judges, military officers, and wealthy industrialists, all refined people. But it was still only an old-style funeral without Red Riders. The chief rider waited politely until the people finished singing. Then he cried anew, anew. Now we sing the favorite song of the departed. Daughter of Zion, be glad. But he couldn't finish because the fat pastor began a droning eulogy over at the other funeral. The chief rider waited another five minutes, ten minutes, but the pastor would not stop and was making it bad for me. Such a speed speech will speed the decomposition of my corpse considerably, I thought to myself. The chief rider thought so too and looked at his watch, but the pastor talked and talked. 
Finally, it was too long for the chief rider. He had only been paid for two hours. He commanded anew, and all forty-five red riders let out at once. Daughter of Zion, be glad. The pastor fought on and would not give in. But what is the power of a preacher against forty-five red riders? I felt solid satisfaction that the youths were winning and my modern funeral would clear the battlefield and put the old middle-class world to shame. The pastor stopped. But the clergy can never really be defeated. That will not do. He spoke to a couple of gentlemen in top hats, and they in turn spoke to some guards. The guards put their helmets on their heads and came over to my grave. They were eager to speak with the chief rider, but he held his position. We are doing our job, he said coldly. Do you have a permit? One of the guards asked. Certainly, the chief rider answered and reached into his wallet. Here it is, an official permit for my red riders. Hmm, remarked the guard. A permit for burials? The red riders will do anything, the chief declared bravely. Bravo, bravo, I cried in my crate. No one here shouts bravo, the guard yelled. He demanded that all the red riders leave, but the chief rider would not. He was not yet finished with the celebration that he had been commissioned and paid for. He was an honorable man, and his highest principle was a strict sense of duty. He requested that the guards leave in an orderly way. Such a shrewd citizen, I thought. Now it will get into the press and make good publicity for him. The guards yelled, but the chief rider yelled even louder. Slowly, all the professors, judges, military officers, and wealthy industrialists came over from the other funeral and mixed in. When the pastor came, it was entirely too late. He saw the red riders in the red caps and jackets with cigarettes in their mouth. Phooey, he said. Then he took his glasses off and set them on my crate. Fragile, do not drop. What's going on here, he asked sharply. It was little Fritz that gave him the dreadful answer. He really couldn't smoke, and the cigarette was making him sick. He bent forward and then back and then forward again in an even faster motion. That's when the accident happened all over the black gown of the pastor. At first he was speechless, but then everyone was trying to give him his or her handkerchiefs. He got hold of himself and declared seriously, That really oversteps all boundaries. I am publicly offended. I am also publicly offended, voiced a gentleman with 27 medals. We have jurisdiction because we are publicly offended, said the guards. Things were getting much too colorful for me. I saw that I must come to the help of my hard-pressed red riders. I shoved the lid open, stood up, and cried in wrath. And I, gentlemen for your disrespectful participation in my burial, I am publicly offended. The pastor stared horrified into the grave. Is this a Christian burial? he stammered. No, I said, this is a modern burial with red riders. I sat on my crate, jammed my eyepiece into my eye, and glared at the people. I was in pajamas, but had been afraid of getting too cold in the grave, so I had brought my fur coat along as well. That made quite an impression on the gentleman, since it was the middle of summer. No one was paying attention to the funeral of the privy councillor, that was for certain. Get out of here, go away, I started. I paid for this grave, and it belongs to me. I am legally dead and can have a little fun if I want. Go away. Here in this hole and in this crate, I am master of the house, and I advise you not to trespass. 
This is a scandal, said the gentleman with the medals. This is a malicious scandal. Then the public prosecutor came. There must be an end to this foolish charade, he hissed at me. I arrest you in the name of the law. I request the guards do their duty. The guards climbed into the hole and laid their wide paws on my shoulders. But I looked at them sharply and said, Have you lost all respect for the sanctity of the dead? He's not dead. He's a fraud, said the angry public prosecutor. Really? I laughed. Just a moment, I will offer the guards my death certificate. Here, satisfy yourselves. And by the way, I went on, if this slip from the county doctor is not enough, prove it yourself, you old ass. The gentleman with the medals stuck his nose in the air, sniffed and moved back. The devil, he cried. Please keep the boundary of decency and good manners, my friend, I admonished. Bear in mind where we are. It is a torrid, red-hot July day and almost noon. I am a corpse. I have a right to stink. But the public prosecutor wouldn't calm down. That means nothing to me, he declared. I see only that a rude public nuisance has begun and the public nuisance demands legal atonement. I request the guards lay the gentleman in his crate and bring him along. Everyone else, please follow me. The guards grabbed me. I attempted to offer resistance, but they were much stronger than I, and quickly stuck me into the crate and carried me out of the cemetery to the carriage. Everyone followed. The gentlemen climbed into their light carriages, and the red riders sprang onto their bicycles. Even the gravedigger came with. The only thing I was happy about was that the privy councillor, whose old-fashioned funeral I had so disturbed, was now all alone and lying abandoned. The stupid fellow must really be annoyed. My crate sat on a beam of wood, and a fat policeman sat up on top. Thank God I could see a little through a knothole. We traveled back through the city at a sharp trot, and then we halted in front of the court building. Room 41, cried the public prosecutor. The guards carried my crate and me inside. Everyone else pushed hastily into the room. The district court judge sat above between his lay magistrates. The public prosecutor stopped a long speech. He apologized for so suddenly interrupting the proceedings with some very urgent pressing, really brooking no delay business needed to be dealt with. Then he told the entire course of events and what had happened. This fellow claims to be dead, he closed, and is in possession of an authentic legal death certificate. The district court judge let me out of my crate. Is there a doctor in the audience, he asked. Three gentlemen came forward. An ordinary doctor, a staff doctor, and a psychiatrist, the director of the state lunatic asylum. They examined me while holding their handkerchiefs over their noses. They made it really short. He is most certainly a corpse. I had one. I would like to charge the public prosecutor with violation of a corpse, I said. Let the accused stand here for the time being, moved the chairman. Not any longer, dear sir, I replied. I am in a condition of... Observe the dignity of the court, he interrupted me. I would like you to be fined permit you to be quiet he yelled no i said i will not be quiet as a prussian i have the right to freely express myself in word writing or image he laughed 
We are not in Prussia anymore. And besides, you are not a Prussian. You are a corpse. I'm not a Prussian anymore? No. Well, then I am a dead Prussian. And a dead Prussian, he trumped me, absolutely has no civil rights. Even you must understand that. I thought about it. He was right. I was vexed, but quieted. You stand here, he began again, accused of gross misconduct, resisting arrest, and contempt of court. Do you have anything to say in your defense? I am a corpse, I whimpered downcast. That is no excuse, asserted the judge. It would be nice if corpses, and especially Prussian corpses, could go unpunished for all misdemeanors. But that would be contrary to what is said about corpses, that they are quiet to the highest degree, well, so to speak. Be setting a shining example of virtue for all living citizens. As a former Prussian, you should know that it is the first duty and that goes for all types of so-called corpses. This case is entirely unheard of, that a deceased individual has become indignant and even more openly stands in front of me. Nothing like this has ever happened in all my long years of practice. Have you ever been convicted? Yes, I stood up straight. Seventeen times for contempt for two fights, for spreading malicious pamphlets, as well as for all the misdemeanors I stand here accused of. You are backsliding, he stressed. It appears that you don't want to remain quiet. I was always innocent, I stammered. Always innocent, scorned the judge. I wonder... Will you quit these misdemeanors? Will you learn from this? I sealed my fate. I don't care about any of that at all. Leave me in peace. Well, I'm a corpse, and you are an idiot, and all of you are idiots. The chairman raised his hand, but before he could say a word, the public prosecutor stood up. I propose the accused should be transferred to the insane asylum for six weeks, and his state of mind observed. The psychiatrist and the director of the asylum came forward quickly and declared, Under these circumstances, the insane asylum must refuse to take the accused for six weeks. I can't risk the danger of keeping him that long. There was a small pause. Then one of the jurors asked, Yes, but what are we going to do with him? We're going to give him a fine, said the judge. That won't do any good, I remarked. I am dead and don't have any more money than when I was alive. I gave out my last coin for a proper burial. The chief of the Red Riders made a contract with me. Then he must certainly not go free under any circumstances, said the public prosecutor. But the prison won't take him any more than the insane asylum, the chairman objected. He was very inconsolable. I believed I had won when suddenly the unctuous pastor came to their assistance. I think I can make a suitable proposal, gentlemen, he said. I believe it would be best if the deceased, the accused, were given a Christian burial. I don't want a Christian burial, I cried wildly. But the pastor made, paid no attention to me. A very Christian and very civilized burial, he went on. I believe in this case it would put things right for the charity and honor of the court and for all decent thinking people. It would also, to a certain extent, cause this confused spirit of the accused to be punished and regret his actions. This is dangerous, but if I am permitted to interior the deceased in this way, 
I believe you will remain quiet, unmoving, and won't cause any more problems in the future. Very good, very good, the chairman nodded. The public prosecutor nodded. Both jurors nodded. Everyone nodded. I screamed furiously and turned in my despair to the chief Red Rider. He shrugged his shoulders. I am very sorry, he said. We were only paid for two hours, and they have run out. The Red Riders will do anything that is our highest principle, but only if we are paid. No one sympathized with me. I defended myself the best I could, but was quickly overpowered. They stuck me in a black coffin and carried me out. The pastor held a eulogy for me free without pay. I don't know what he said because I plugged my ears. Brute force has conquered. What is the use of turning over three times whenever a public prosecutor or district court judge walks past my grave? The end of the story. And there we have a little bit of humor from Hans Heinz Ewers. I hope you enjoyed that. We'll try to get a humorous story for the next one, too, as well. Uh, remember, uh, if you like this, give it a like. Subscribe so you don't miss any more. Thank you.